everyone um, coming on. This is a first for, for most of us to do a live webinar uh, question and answers of you know, some visual performance, some things that we've been doing. Some of you guys, I recognize some of the face or the names out there. Um, I don't see any faces. We just have names. So uh, we welcome any questions. Uh, give you a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been trained visual performance skills for 20 years now, working with athletes of all different uh, levels from uh, low levels to college to pro uh, and all different sports, a lot in baseball, lots in softball and a lot of different other sports. And um, I, I'm the director and owner of Slow the Game Down and also the director of Train of Neurodynamic Vision, which is a new um, venture for us. And you got Warren on the screen here and Warren is, is part of Neurodynamic Vision. And then we got Neil on there with the Oakland A's hat, who is part of a Max BP, who is putting this on for us. And uh, you got the emails from Neil. And then we got a good friend of mine, Calix Krabby from the Texas Rangers on there. And Calix, I'll give you a little, let you give a little bit of background about you, what you've done and how we got to meet. Yeah. Um, so I won't take too much of your time. Hopefully you guys um, enjoy, enjoy the time that we're gonna spend here together. But so I met um, Ryan, um, in 2010, um, you know, when, you know, his dad, a special man, obviously, um, was around with us. And, you know, I'm originally from the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, left St. Thomas when I was 15 years old. I I've been a crazy baseball dude my whole life. Um, moved to Georgia, ended up falling in love with, um, you know, with this, this idea of trying to make it to the big leagues. And um, I spent quite a bit of time in the minor leagues up until about 2008 when I made my uh, my opening day roster with the Padres. And then I kind of went on a hiatus from being a very good player. Um, I was good up until that point. Um, and then I went through some struggles trying to figure out how to get myself back on track. And, and that's when I met um, Ryan and his dad. And um, the relationship kind of spawned from there. And um, here we are today. So that's the short version of it without <laughs> getting too winded. Um, I'm sure as we go along, we'll get to share more stories. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it was awesome. Uh, you know, Calix, I, I, I was very lucky to uh, work with my dad, which is, um, you know, a phenomenal time through those 20 years. Can't say it was all peachy keen. We, we had our struggles as well, sure. but, uh, but it was definitely a great learning environment. And, um, you know, I, I got to learn from the best and it's, it's awesome. I got to be around the best and, and it was fun being around different teams, including the Blue Jays at those years we were there. And, you know, a lot of lasting relationships that I got to meet, you know, including you and, and you know, experiment new things with you, try new things with you, different players, and, and try to figure out how we can make athletes more efficient. Um, you know, that, that's the goal. When we talk about vision, we talk about mechanics, we talk about any of this other stuff. It's really about trying to get the athlete themselves to be as good as they can be. And I know, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit, Calix, about some of your uh, – your struggles that you were when we got to meet, uh, maybe you can add a little bit more to that. To sure. Um, and so, you know, for a long time, you know, I'll, I'll be blunt as a, as a boy growing up, um, I challenged myself daily growing up in the Virgin Islands. Um, I would hit rocks, bottle caps. I would hit you know, anything that was moving that gave me a chance to be able to, to kind of predict um, what's going to happen with the base, with the, with the baseball through these different little outlets. And so um up until about, like I said, 2000 and, you know, 2009, um, hitting, I'm not saying it was easy, but, you know, my ability to put the bat on the ball was, was one of my um, best skill sets. And so it got to a point where um, I had a small little um, injury take place, um, you know, where I, uh, I kind of banged my head a little bit and didn't really re kind of realize what happened. At the moment, we know a lot more now. Um, and so for, for a little bit of time, I lost this ability to, um, to have my best skill set work on day in and you know, work day in and day out. So my swing and miss rate started to go up. Um, and so sure enough, um, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and then I met your dad, I met you. And, um, I, you know, I learned, I learned a few things. And, and then obviously, um, I love making sure as a hitting coach that I'm focusing on all aspects of hitting and I try to bring them all together. And so, um, yeah, I dealt with I dealt with a few things, and then I finally started to figure it out in in 2011, and it kind of calmed my mind out a little bit. Yeah, and as you know, you know, hitting is not an easy task. Um, you know, there's a lot of components to it, and you know, a lot of these people who are listening. They they submitted some great questions that we'll go over. Mm -hmm. But you know, from from my perspective, um, 
if, if the eyes aren't giving you the right information, it makes a lot of the other stuff a little bit challenging. And, you know, your eyes were not working necessarily properly. It doesn't mean you have bad eyes. It doesn't mean you couldn't see. It's just with the, the knock in the head, with the thoughts that were going on in your mind, mm -hmm. it, it, it gets you into the wrong mode instead of getting into the visual mode. And hitting oh, sure. first and foremost is vision. And if you, if you can't see it, you're just swinging and hopefully you're getting lucky. And unfortunately, as, as we have a lot of coaches on here, we all uh, assume that everyone can see. We all assume that everyone, you know, if, go get their eyes checked. You know, that's, that's the biggest answer. And, you know, even, um, you know, I'll tell a few different stories here, but we had a player uh, this offseason, a professional player that had a concussion. And he actually tested out uh, 2013 vision. And he says he couldn't see the ball really well. And, and the, the doctors didn't understand. They were trying to give him a surgery. They were trying all these different things, six weeks rest. He'd come back, he goes, I still can't see the change of velocity. I don't see any of that information. And it was really about getting those eyes and brain uh, and body to work together. We call it the eye, mind, body. And those are some of the things that you were learning back then as a player was how you can, um, you, you can, add you know a visual task and be more visually uh oriented when it comes to the game yeah the reality is for me is i i i was getting distracted um it, i think a lot of people um, don't put enough emphasis on that i think um, when you look at a major league player or or an elite hitter um you make this you have this assumption that they're just elite because they're elite right like yes they do possess some um unique talent and maybe some unique skill sets but the second that an athlete um, begins to get distracted uh, on the field of play, their skill sets and their talents are going to be, they're going to get diminished. It, it is what it is. And I think when I was unable to organize my thoughts, stress, anxiety started to come up, you know, come upon my, uh, my mind and my, and my, and affect my eyes. And the reality is, is that at that point I couldn't process what I was seeing and um, created the wrong amount of stress, you know? Yeah. I, and you know, there's a lot of answers. Um, there's not one answer. There's not a one. You know, a lot of people want to ask me all the questions. Hey, what's the magic? There's no pill? one answer. Yeah, there's no magic pill. Sorry. It, everyone <laughs> is different, and every way we go about it is, is creating, you know, finding out what are the weak points and what can we do to enhance those. And some of it's just the, you know, the thought process that people have. You and know, where, you know, even using this Max BP, um, you know, we talked about that uh, prior to getting on this. It was a great tool for you and, and tell everyone how you would use it. And it but basically, it gave you something to aim small, miss small, sure. and really focus on, on what you were seeing and not focus on all the other stuff that was going on. Yeah, in some ways, it took me back to what it was like to be a kid. Um, when, when baseball, for me, when I was acquiring skills, um, it, was about, it was about having some fun. It was about um, getting, um, creating a challenging environment so that I can make my skills that much better when I get in the arena. Um, the Max BP was a huge tool. Quite frankly, um, with, the, with the Rangers, we have several of the units, as um, Neil um, can attest to, um, and we use them on a daily basis. Um, I have guys that are ordering them, and, and right now, while they're on break, they're in their apartments, and um, Isaiah Kainer Falefa is down in Hawaii, and then you have Jose Trevino. Um, Joey Gallo just texted me a few days ago, hey, I need to get a machine while I'm here at home. Um, and so I use, I use it day in and day out um, to kind of get my eyes and my, uh, my mind prepped for the high, speed, high velocities of baseball, but also the change of, um, the change of speed and also the, the pitch trajectories. Um, it, it, was, it was a huge tool for me, and that's why I continue to use it with my guys. Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of funny, um, you know, we're not funny, but we're all in this situation where we're not getting to practice with other people. We're not getting to run out. Right. And, um, you know, the, the small ball, high velocity machine, you know, it, it, it is something that people can do on their own. And it's really the only thing they can get to get high velocity right now when they can't get in front of a pitcher. Right. And, you know, I used to have, before Neil came to me, when Max BP was built, I used to have an older machine um, and guys would take it in their house and they were hitting it off lamps. And, and in fact, I think we still have some video, Neil, of some guys that were still using the Max BP even in the houses as well or inside the locker room. So it is a great tool uh, to work on, you know, 
again, what I talk about is aim small, miss small, but also get some velocity of something that that's happening. And, you know, you, it's not just working on hitting, you can work no. on tracking, yeah. you can work on catching it, you can work decision on decision making, you can you can use it in a, in a multitude of ways. Um, I, with Joey Gallo, for example, we have um, different colored wiffle balls, we go through decision making drills where uh, I tell Joey, I only want you to hunt the yellow, the yellow wiffle balls. Um, and so obviously, with the high rate of speed that the ball is coming, you have to really be um, focused and, and keeping the mind calm and the eyes um, you know, soft correctly so you can make the accurate decision. And then I go ahead and I adjust those, um, those colors and, and dynamically train him. Um, it's been huge, huge for him, Hunter Pence. Um, last year, Hunter Pence, um, I, I'm not saying this is the only reason why he became an all-star, because uh, I, I would like to think that our coaching staff had something to do with it. Um, but Hunter Pence right now, while he's quarantined, um, and I actually need to get, respond back to Hunter. Hopefully, he doesn't see this. He'll, he'll want to beat me up. Um, <laughs> but um, he uses I he's using the machine right Hunter now. <laughs> he's, a, he's, he's a man. Um, so, yeah, um, guys could be using that thing. I, my son, uh, to be quite frank, I have one here. Um, I actually need to send him back, Neil, um, we talked about. But nonetheless, my son uses it daily. Um, and it's awesome. I mean, it's a great tool. Now, Calix, um, talking about, you know, some vision stuff and, yeah. and, you know, we have this conversation, you grew up in the Virgin Islands and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would imagine that in a situation growing up, you didn't have a lot of people you played with, you didn't have a lot of, sit, you know, um, a lot of things going on necessarily, you had to cr be creative to yourself and sure. figure out how to be a baseball player. And this is where maybe kids today, as well as coaches, what are some creative things that you know, in this situation that we're at, can you, did you do that might be something they could do today? Yeah. So, you know, I, um, you know, I was a few things, full disclosure, I was very lucky. Um, I had a really good coach in St. Thomas. Um, baseball wasn't super big um, for us, but we, I went through a very specific period in the Caribbean where the Virgin Islands got really good at baseball and I was a part of that group. Um, and so I, I got lucky with good coaching, but what I did uh, better than most is when I wasn't at the field, I was always practicing um, to, a, to a fault where my schoolwork would suffer <laughs> because of it. Um, but I would, I would take popcorn seeds, for example, with a broomstick. I, would, I mean, I cannot tell you how many of my mother's broomsticks um, I broke um, swinging and hitting um, concrete walls by mistake. But I would put pop, popcorn seeds in my mouth and I would spit them up, up in the air and I would work on making contact with them. I would go and collect with a very good friend of mine, two of them, Akeem Francis and Keyshawn Herbert. I would go and collect um, bottle caps um, from underneath our building. I would go get Heineken bottles, I, would, I mean, um, bottle caps. I would go ahead and get Sunny Delight bottle caps. <laughs> and we would collect, collect as many of them as we possibly can. And underneath our, um, our apartment complex, we would, we would throw them to each other and hit off of them. Um, I also had, um, this was crazy, it was probably not a smart thing. Um, do not do this at home. But there was a wire um, underneath our apartment complex that um, fell down. And that wire kind of formed like a little, um, like a, like a hammock type shape. And I would go with my uh, mother's broomstick and I, would, and I would hit that wire and it would go up in the air and come back. And I'll hit it again, it would go up in the air and it would come back. And lo and behold, I was teaching myself at a time uh, with a very small um, center, of, center of mass in the, in the, uh, the broomstick. So um, a few other things I would do is I would, I would steal my sister's um, co coins, so 25 cents at a time, and I would go to this supermarket and we would get those you know, little incredible balls, little bouncy balls. And I would probably take $10 in coins and collect as many of those balls as I could. And we would throw those at each other day in and day out. Um, and so as time went on, naturally I got better than, than most around me. And my greatest skill set turned into my, uh, my bat to ball skills, so. Yeah, I saw a video the other day and uh, forgive me of uh, what player this was. I believe it's a Cub player. Yeah, um, they, the catcher, Contreras, Jose Contreras. Yeah, they had the Nerf gun shooting uh, little Nerf balls and yep, yep. Uh, the player hit uh, and he was hitting them. And, you know, that's one of the things that we tend to do a lot of times in our training is we use a lot of small ball, a lot of small mm -hmm. uh, tools, including um, we, we have a tool that I've been using recently is a, um, they're discs and they're about mm -hmm. the size of um, – like more of the five gallon water bottle disc. Yep. And I know a lot mm -hmm. of people in Latin America used to hit those. That's exactly these, yep. these are rubber ones and we can fling them and guys are hitting them with broomsticks or hitting them with regular bats. And um, it's, it's pretty phenomenal just getting that, you know, tuning in that eye hand coordination. And, you know, again, you know, it, it's kind of, 
you know, given, but it makes you focus on something a little bit more. It's and funny. Trying to focus on everything. It's funny though. Like I felt like I, I built this, um, this database um, of, of different movements as a kid. And so as I got um, into higher competitive environments and pitchers naturally start to get better and you start to see some, some better movement capabilities, sure enough, I, I was never affected by it because of um, my, I, would, I guess I would call it pitch tracking capabilities or my pitch recognition um, capabilities, like was from all from these little bottle caps. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, pitch recognition, you know, it, it's, that's something a lot of people talk about. They want to improve their pitch recognition, including, um, I think that was some of the questions that people asked. Yeah, and, I did see some of those. You know, it, it, I, again, I wish there was one answer that I could yeah. say, guys, you got to do this and, and you're going to be a lot better and it's going to change the world. But the reality, and, and what I talk a lot to, to, from, from a hitter standpoint is, what is your task? What's your task as a hitter? And a lot of people will tell me that their task is to get on base, to move runners, to hit home runs, to get the ball in the air, whatever, whatever that is. And I tell them, no, that's a goal. And goals are made to break. And goals, you're never going to accomplish all your goals. But the task is a lot simpler. And it's really about stepping into the plate, getting focused on the task of seeing the ball the best you can. And some people are going to see it better than others, but you got to get good at seeing the ball early. You got to get well, good at seeing the ball to contact. And that gives you the most amount of time to react to that task. So if I had any suggestion, people had asked this in some of the questions, what should my kid focus on at nine years old? What should I focus on 10 years old? What should I focus even at, at 25 years old in the pro? What part of the ball are you looking at? How focused are you on the ball? And are you seeing it early? And are you seeing it as close to contact as possible? Um, you know, so, I mean, I, I fall in line with that. I think um, the, the reality is, is that obviously every hitter, um, some have better skill, set, the skill sets than others. And I, my job as a hitting coach is to, to be able to accurately identify what they need the most and try my best to, um, again, holistically serve them um, with the resources to, to make them the most complete hitter that you possibly can. But again, the reality is, is if you don't have the ability to, to time with a pitcher and see, um, see the ball as early as possible and, and not lose that, um, lose that ball immediately, you get that ball um, moving as close as, as it can and seeing it as long as you can, you will be able to make better decisions, right? Like, um, you know, there was a question on there about bat speed, right? Like, Look, the reality is I'm not saying a bat speed isn't important, but I think if you had great decision making capabilities, you can and you have good bat speed, you can wait longer. Right. Like we all we all know that. So Jerry um, Bond, one of those guys, you're right. Like and not again, not every I wasn't a pure bat speed guy. So I had to rely. I had to rely a lot on on having, you know, good visual capabilities. Um, so I, I couldn't wait as, as long as some of the other guys. But imagine the type of, um, you know, monster you can create. If you have good decision making capability, good decision making capabilities paired with good bat speed and some bat to ball accuracy, you can have a, a, a pretty good hitter. Yeah, you know, a question a lot of people ask me, Calix, and, and you and I may differ on this, um, may argue and may come up with great answers, but, you know, what is timing? And, and everyone says to be on time, you got to get on time. Well, what does that mean? How to be on time? What, what, what are some of the thoughts you, you, no, I, I think we've obviously we've we've communicated on this quite a bunch. I think um, your eyes have to be able to go to the right spot at the right time. I also think that a, a hitter needs to know when to start, right? Like um, a lot of hitters don't know when they should take their eyes to a particular spot or even when they should create their load, right? Like the pitcher loads you and knowing when to take your eyes to that spot is extremely critical um, to your ability to return your foot back down to the ground on time, right? So the end product is going to be whenever you return back to the ground, but where you take your eyes, when you take your eyes and how you can load with the pitcher is really, really important. So I don't think that, I think that they're all, they're all yeah. joined together. Um, I, I, I would, I, you've talked about this, obviously your eyes are important, right? But um, you to hit with the spot, on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that you have to put an emphasis on, on, on three or four of those things and get good at all of them. So you can be the most you know, efficient hitter that you possibly can be.
Yeah, and you know, even you know, we have a variety of different people from different sports uh, listening in, and uh, we have some doctors listening in as well. And you know, what I always try to tell people: look, vision is complex. It, it's so yeah. complex, and and I always tell people there's kind of three aspects to vision. And what a lot of coaches want to say is, well, go get your eyes checked if you're not seeing the ball right. Well, that is one aspect. That may be the problem. It may not be the problem. But then there's the, the skill sets of how the eyes function, how, how they track, how the muscles of the eyes work, how the brain works, how the reaction. I know some people asked about reaction time on here. And then third is, how do you, how do you use your eyes when you step on the field? Yeah. And that's one thing when we talk about timing, step into the plate, your eyes are going to tell you what's happening. Whether you need to start earlier, start later, that's all dependent on, on what your eyes are telling your brain and how you react. And like you said, some guys have faster swings, some have lower, some have better loads, some have fast loads, slow. Some have lower leg kicks, some have foot down yeah. early. You, I mean, you have to assess all of those things. Yeah. They're all important and they're all parts of this, the, the puzzle that makes you a great hitter. But again, if you're worried about what your foot's doing? Are you worried about what your hand's doing? Are you worried about what the umpire's going to say or what the coach is going to say? Or a lot of us, what's mom or coach going to yell at us? Then we're not mm -hmm. focused on that task and we're not putting our eyes to where we need to get to. Now, sure, sure. some people had asked the questions, well, where, where should my eyes be? And, um, you know, that's a, I'm not going to say it's a long story, but your eyes got to be at the release point at the right time, not too early, not too late. And how we get there can be different for each person. We believe there are some ways that can be more efficient. Um, but, you know, if we could put some uh, uh, synaptic strobe uh, glasses on you and turn, the, turn your eyes off and then just turn them on at the right time and your eyes are lasered in the right spot, you'll be fine too. So, the rea you know, you got to get to a point into a position where your eyes are right at – can get right to the release point at the right time. Sure. I got nothing to add on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, maybe, maybe for you, maybe you can add this to people. When you were struggling, what were you seeing? Well, uh, quite frankly, I, I don't think I was, uh, I was seeing a blur, um, but the blur, uh, I, I kind of, I, I kind of pinpointed to, to a couple of things, but one is, there was there was stress um i i knew that whenever the ball would leave the pitcher's hand i wasn't getting pure clarity i wasn't seeing in in 1080p um I, I just i wasn't in high definition and so naturally um the body is going to react um to that uncertainty that the eyes are that are that the eyes are sending to the brain and then obviously the, the body responds to that and so um things look like a blur i felt like i needed to cheat a little bit more um it was hard for me to uh, maintain a constant rate of breathing. Um, because again, once you become stressed, the, the nervous system and, and, and the breathing um, begins, to, begins to change and quicken, uh, which, make, which makes it very challenging to make um, good responsive decisions um, while you're in the batter's box. And so, um, you know, once I, again, once I learned to calm, to calm my, my brain down and start to really reorganize where I was looking, and when I personally needed to start, right? Like I, I was a switch hitter. And so as a switch hitter, I had two different moves, um, righty and lefty. And that was something that I had to relearn again because um, it wasn't the same for me on, on both sides of the plate. My eyes had to go to very different um, release points and, and how I was using them before I got to that release point. Um, I had to become very, very deliberate about how I, um, how I was gonna to kind of train that. And so, um, yeah, it was everything looked like a blur. Things seemed to speed up, and it just kind of went throughout all of my all of my different systems, and it was it was hard to perform that way. Yeah, and that's why I think you know we talked quite a few different times at different periods of your career, but and I, we talk about with all these players is I always ask, what are you seeing? What are you looking at when you're struggling? And then yeah. what are you seeing when you're going good, and and how do we get back to that? And how can we do a, even maybe a better job? And you know one of the things that you know, the way our eyes work is when we tend to stare, which happens when we get stressed, yeah. our vision tends to blur. Sure. We tend to feel and we tend to get... I need to see it more. I would need to see it better, right? Like that was, yeah. that was something, right? That was something yeah. that, that happened to me, to me quite a bit. Um, yeah, but then when we figured out ways like, okay, how do we move our eyes and how do we switch mm -hmm. our eyes to 
least point at the right time. Mm -hmm. That's when the ball looked big. That's when it slowed down. They slowed it down. Mm -hmm. it's, sure. it's locked in on seeing that. And, and sure. that's the key is learning how to switch your eyes right at the right time. And even yeah. you know, that's one thing with the Max BP too, with the little red light that we have on there is not staring right at that hole or, or pitching machine staring at the hole, but look away, let your eyes relax. And then right before the ball is going to come out, switch your eyes right there at the right time, pick up a part of the ball. And now the ball looks bigger, slows down. And let's not discount. Let's not discount. This is on defense as well. Um, I, the reality is, is I know we're, we're here talking about the, the, the old sexy hitting. Hitting obviously is, is, is important. It's going to get you paid. I, I get it. Like I'm a hitting coach. So don't, I mean, I love talking hitting, but even on defense, I found myself um, some of the same things that I was dealing with in the batter's box was kind of carrying over uh, to defense. And so sure enough, I struggled there as well until I learned again to um, take my eyes to the right spot. I learned to um, give myself breaks in between pitches um, instead of, you know, you know, thinking of, of the fact that I don't want this ball hit to me, even to a point where um, not only visually was I bad, but my mental recall was extremely bad. How I was visualizing things um, was significantly impacting uh, my ability to trust myself in the batter's box, right? Like the previous event pitch or the, or the day before of not seeing the ball well was this constant memory um, in, my, in my brain that was affecting my ability to free up and, and not be jammed up, up, you know, up a home plate. Yeah. Hey, um, we got a lot of questions here, but uh, yes, do. Hand is Bert Strain. I'm allowing him to talk and see what his question is on there. Go ahead. Bert, you there? Let's see. He's muted. Let me see if I can unmute him. Hold on. Uh, it doesn't look like it's muting. So, Bert, if you get this, uh, go ahead and um, let's see. Can you hear me, guys? I can hear you now. Yes. Oh, great. Thanks. Hey, guys, great that you guys put this on. So many young players. I'm an ex-pro player, uh, played in Japan, spent time in Cuba, which opened my eyes. And my question was real simple. For decades since the aluminum bat came in, I'm an old dude, but since the aluminum bat came in, I would say 70 to 80 percent, even maybe more, of pitchers are middle away at the youth level. I'm not talking about the big leagues or pro players. What I found is that we coaches, and I'm putting we like the Cubans say, you Americans, <laughs> we coaches simply say, let it travel, let it travel. How many millions of times we've said that? Well, the problem, the Cubans don't even respond to that with a verbal response. They just put their hand across their neck and say, you Americans. If you put, and I've proven this at a high level, and I got some guys in the big leagues right now, if you put your eyes on the pitch middle away, you're looking at that pitch middle away. That's where you go. We've taught over generations. You look there, middle away, pitch down the middle. You're going to hit a little bit out in front of the pitch, middle in. You better get there because it's going to be a little further. The Cubans say no. You put your eyes in the identical same spot. So where the pitch is middle away, you put your eyes there. Pitch down the middle, you put your eyes where it was for middle away. Pitch middle in, the magic comes because you put your eyes in the same spot. I didn't make that up. Barry Bonds told me that. So I know it works. We don't teach it in the United States. It is what it is. But I know that it works because it's proven. The game has changed from top hand pulling to staying inside the ball, hitting it. And remember, I'm an old dude. So top hand was the game. Then all of a sudden, aluminum bats, now it's staying inside the ball, hit the bottom part inside the ball. And I agree with that totally. That's why we got so many darn foul balls. That's why they're putting up netting. Games are over three hours because we got a massive amount of foul balls. The Oakland A's, and I see you there. I'm very close with Steve Vucinich. I played in the minor leagues. Boo knows me well. I spent a lot of time in Oakland. I'm in Atlanta now. But to make a long story short, when we're telling young players, eyes are the key, does your brain, the question, real simple. Which is the worst way? You see the ball, you tell your brain, let it travel, don't let it travel, hit it out here. Or your eyes tell you where the plane of the bat is. If you see it, you get it. If your eyes go to the same spot. That's my opinion. It works. And again, I got a number of guys in the big leagues that has kind of proven it out. What's your guys' thoughts? Yeah, Bert, um, uh, I appreciate that. And uh, we probably all have uh, some response. And 
you know, I've been doing this vision stuff for, like I said, 20 years. My dad for 49 years, I think it was. And it, it, it is amazing how uh, we don't really understand how to talk eyes like we, like we should. And um, the eyes are going to lead. The eyes lead the mind and the body. And when we talk to ourselves, we get less visual. So if we're saying, let it travel, let it travel, or hit the inside, it can create some, to me, some bad habits. And I do think um, that we have to, you know, maybe, and that's one of the things I'd like to do is to help change the wording of getting guys to understand how do we look at the ball differently? How do we look at things? And there was a question in, in that someone had uh, put in here is they're popping the ball up a lot. Do they need to change their hands? And to me, I want to say, well, what part of the ball are you looking at? And maybe what you need to look at is look at the top half of the ball and that allow your swing. It doesn't sound right, but it's going to allow your swing to do what it needs to do to be efficient as it can be. So looking at different places and, and you talk about Barry, uh, my dad worked with Barry. I got some great video of him and Barry talking back in the, the, the minor leagues when before Barry made it to the big leagues, but about staying visual and getting the eyes to lead the hands. And Calix, you can add to that or, or uh, disagree. Yeah. Um, so no, no, I, I, um, I definitely, I'm not of the school to tell someone um, to let, to let about travel, but I will, I, I will say this. Um, if it works within a player's belief system, I don't have a problem with it. I think um, that's the, that's the one caveat um, to the statement. Um, I couldn't let the ball get deep. I, I purely um, didn't have the, the pure bat speed to be able to do something like that. But also, um, I think it comes back to internal, external cueing. Um, the more that we focus on something internally, the slower our brain is going to react externally. And so I think, um, you know, if, if, if that word is being thrown around a lot to, to the large masses without understanding um, what allows that player to do the actual action, um, I think that's where the danger comes into, into using certain, certain phrases. Um, but for example, um, you know, Joey Gallo, I'll use him only because he comes to the top of my mind. Joey Gallo um, has a long stride. He has long arms, right? Like, and Joey Gallo can't let the ball get too, too deep, right? Like, cause we know that his levers won't work as good with the ball deep into the zone. Um, and so I definitely am on your side and I don't have a, I, I don't have a problem with old school versus new school. I think, um, Old school guys, you guys have a lot of really good things that you guys get to offer, just like some of us, um, you know, new school guys. I don't even know what that means, but new school guys get to offer. We might have, we've had more examinations on things, so maybe we can explain it with a little bit more um, um, structure to it, but it doesn't mean that you're wrong. Um, but I definitely don't agree with it, with the idea of to tell everyone just to let the ball get deep. I think that is detrimental because, again, it slows the brain down from from um, focusing really on what the task is. So I think we all agree. Um, but again, I w it doesn't mean I won't use that word for someone that it makes sense to. I think that's the, that's the trick to coaching, right? Like is figuring out what is going to get the player to actually make the action, right? So there's um, definitely words, uh, Calix, you know, and you know this as a coach is, that I've used that doesn't work for a player. And there's other words that I don't agree with, but I use. But it, might, but it works. Because it works on there. Works. And exactly. you know, for me, like letting the ball travel, you know, I'm that word a little bit, but it's really, for me, it's, it's to see it. your eyes to let the ball. No, get your understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what we see a lot of, and especially in a lot of the um, stuff online today, but, but, but it goes back is a lot of times people making contact and their eyes are way out towards third base. So they're out towards first base mm -hmm. and sure. their, their eyes are, are off somewhere else. And where our mm -hmm. eyes from a physiological standpoint naturally want to work, they always want to move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So once it, the brain thinks it's complete, it moves to the next thing. This is why we see errors that happen. Guys are watching the ball and then they look up mm -hmm. at the first base sure. and they miss on there. So mm -hmm. always want the eyes to be all the way through whatever the catch point, the contact point, and let the eyes create that, that, that distance uh, and giving you more time to get in there. One Even of the reasons... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I want to cut you off. Go ahead, finish, finish your you story. Know, Sorry. And one of the reasons that that happens is when my eyes are at the contact point or through the contact point, well, let, let me put it this way. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. I, I heard this from, um, um, shoot, why is this one blank? What's our great tennis player? Um, um, male, female? Male. Um, Federer? Uh, Better. Murray. Federer's yeah. really good at letting his eyes get to the contact point. And I read something from him one time. It says he, he doesn't try to see 
the ball hit the tennis racket. He tries to see the ball through the back of his tennis racket. Mm -hmm. And basically what he's doing is he doesn't need to look up to see where he's going. He's really trying to see it all the way through contact and let the, the, the tennis racket go through. So I tell guys, hey, don't try to see the ball hit the bat. Try to see – or let me put – backtrack. Don't let your eyes lead the bat out. Let the bat lead your eyes out. And then yeah. now you're giving yourself that most amount of time to see it and letting your eyes travel and react to what it is. And, and, and I'll jump in a little bit too. And like, for, and you probably remember this, but some that me letting the trying to see the ball hit the bat, it didn't work for me. What I tried to think about was that home plate, you know, so take it, it's flat, and then kind of raise it upwards. I would always think that home plate was at the front of um, – of, of, of the box, but pointed more upwards, right? And so I always felt like I was just defending a window at home plate. Um, that was something that, you know, like literally I could see that in my mind's eye and it allowed me to, to take the bat and, and match the plane of the pitch a little bit easier once my eyes told me where that, that pitch trajectory is gonna be. Um, so, you know, letting it get deep or, or seeing the bat hit the ball, it didn't work for me. I needed to see it right at my front foot or out in front of my front foot and then go ahead and swing up, kind of let my eyes work up. It's funny, it works that way in golf for me as well. The second that I try to keep my head down on the golf ball too long, I get stuck in my, uh, my rotation and I flip my club. So in reality, is, as I'm actually working with a friend of mine right now, is to continue rotating with the club, but, but obviously still see the ball um, on the ground where it needs to be. Golf is obviously different than, than baseball and, and visually speaking uh, because it's, uh, you know, the ball is static, but nonetheless, the way my body works, it's most efficient when I'm not trying to see contact. Yeah, the and there's a difference a little bit of uh, eyes versus what a lot of people like to say is nose to the ball. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Take and, your nose to it. Take your nose. <laughs> you know what, what, again, whatever works, works for, for right. the people that you're working with. Um, it, but you know, when, when I look from a visual standpoint, whether wherever that ball's going to play, I'm looking at, hey, the ball has a release point, whether it's a small pitcher, whether it's a baseball pitcher, a little league pitcher, and it has a point across the plate like you're talking about. And that's the most amount of time you're going to tell your brain, you know, how to react to it. And if you're taking your eyes off it or if you're, if you're – um, you know, thinking about other stuff, you're just not getting that information to allow your eye-hand coordination to work like, like sure. it should. Sure, sure. You know, um, there, there's a question that, that came up a couple times and in a couple different ways, but kind of what percentage of MLB use vision training today? Or what's your favorite vision training drill? And, you know, my experience of being around uh, pro guys I don't know if I can, you can come up with a, a really good percentage. I mean, you can. obviously, if I worked with teams, you know, maybe our percentage is going to be a little bit higher because I worked with those teams. Mm -hmm. Every single team is probably doing something. Right. Are they doing enough? Maybe not. Uh, are they doing the right stuff? Maybe not. Uh, there are a lot of great tools out there, and there's some ways, you know, there's some guys that, that I've talked to that uh, they tell me how they see the ball and how they go about doing it. And you know what? If it works for them, it's the right thing that they're doing. It's giving sure. them that visual belief. It sure. may not be the way I would teach someone, but all of these players, and, and I looked at, and I haven't done this for a long time, but I took um, hitters from uh, um, the, it was the, um, basically the top hitters in the history of the game of baseball. And it was the top hitters that hit over 300 after a certain amount of at-bats. And there was not, um, you know, the number is not really high that have a, that significantly have hit over 300. It's quite a bit, 295, 298, 299, but not a lot above three, 300. And uh, the guys who were above 300, I, I, I'm lucky enough through my dad, I've been around a lot of them, and a lot of them had a visual plan. They may not do visual training necessarily, but they had a visual plan. Some of them definitely have trained but they also had a visual plan. So I guess, Calix, in, in, in your experience around some of your buddies, some of the teams you're working with, um, would you say that some of the betters have a good vision plan uh, uh, or attack or some do vision training? So I'll, um, what I'll do is I'll speak to what we do. Um, I think that's important for me to first um, make, make a point. With the Rangers, we spend quite a bit of time of um, – 
of making sure that there is some visual resources available to our to our hitters. Um, the reality is is that I'm um, sorry for the kids in the background. Um, the reality is is that um, not all players believe they need to work on their vision. All right, so. Um, the best thing that we can do as, as coaches is continue to educate ourselves, continue to provide um, a number of, 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 of options on the menu. Um, you, it's like, I call it like having like a five course meal. So like the first part of it is gonna be is let's make sure that we do some form of visual warm up for our eyes. So I always have my max BP set up in the middle of all um, of our four cages. So there's two cages, max BP, and then two cages, right? So what I do is, is, is the machine's constantly running and I, and I see a guy that might be waiting in line um, to get ready to do some of his, his technical work, right? I might say, hey, Adolis, come over here and let's, let's do some catches really quickly, right? Let's focus on deciding, you know, white with your right, yellow with your left, for example, just for the sake of using a, a real world example. Um, so we, we at the Rangers, I would say that of the 100% of our hitters that were in Major League Spring Training this year, 96% of them were doing some form of visual training, all right? But again, that's because we as a hitting staff, Louis, myself, Alex, our my league hitting coordinator, Cody, we believe that um, track, tracking a baseball, predicting a baseball, seeing the baseball correctly, these are of the utmost importance, right? So now let me shift over to the other part of the question. Um, I know that there is a trend changing with the science that's being provided on, on vision. Um, there is definitely more major league teams um, doing a little bit more. Like, like Ryan said, maybe not enough, but I would have to say that the, the trend is shifting upward, um, which is a very, very good thing because when the pros start to do it, that means that the rest of the, the, rest of the um, baseball industry or whatever industry they're in will at some point begin to follow suit. Um, I probably think it's been backwards in, in baseball. The younger generations are probably doing it more than the, than the major league players. But you can understand why. When you get to the major leagues, it's easy to think that you have it figured out visually. It, it, it is what it is. And so our job is to, to kind of provide, to provide them with that. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question all the way. Um, I think there was maybe one more part to it, and you, maybe you can remind me what the other part of it was, a good no, that, visual plan. That was pretty good. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, one of the challenges that I always ask an athlete, too, is how do you know you can't see better? Sure. You know, let's challenge yourself. Sure. And there are certain athletes that have great visual skills. And, you know, that's another time we can, I can answer some questions on visual skills. And they just see the ball differently than other people. So they think that, you know, they're going to work on other stuff because their visual skills are phenomenal. Sure. Um, and there's guys that have phenomenal visual skills that work even harder to get their vision to be better. And there are certain guys that have, you know, they think they see, but they don't know that they can see better. I was talking with a major league player um, in this off season that I was working with and he had phenomenal vision. And we talked about, I said, you see the ball differently than everyone else, don't you? And he kind of looked at me kind of weird. He goes, how do you know that? And I said, because you have the, the skill sets that are phenomenal. And he goes, yeah, I talk to guys. He goes, I see this. I see spin. I see all of this. And everyone looks at me like I'm crazy. And I look at them and going, hey, how do you not see all that stuff? <laughs> you know, yeah. so guys have different beliefs and different, you know, values of, of how, what they place on seeing. And there are skill sets, you know, whether it's tools like the Max BP, whether it's other tools, there's training machines, classes. There's machines, right, correct. There, there's, there's software, um, there's hardware, there, there's a lot of different aspects of that vision to train it better. Now, kind of promote a little bit that, you know, you and I know about is, is really my goal. Someone asked me about what's the, there's quite a few questions about what's the one thing, what's, what's something you would emphasize, in different ways it was put is I want their two eyes to work together. I want their depth perception to be as phenomenal as it can be. Sure, and sure. Giving a little bit of science of what, what depth perception is, is really about how the two eyes work together and how the brain processes that visual information. There are 14 <laughs> muscles of the eyes, 12 in each, six in each, seven in each eye, but six that are involved in tracking a ball. And if those muscles are tight, if they're not, working as fluid. They're very strong. They're some of the strongest muscles in your body right now. 
but they may not be fluid. They may not track nearly as well, or your brain may not use one over the other, or your eyes may not be aimed in the right spot. This gives you, this, you know, makes it tougher for you to be able to do all these other things. Your timing can be off. You can be out in front all the time. You can be behind a lot. You can be, you know, higher and lower basically because your brain is, it's not that there was anything wrong with you as far as your swing and everything. So your brain is giving you wrong information. So you're giving yourself response. So for all the youngers and even the college coaches that are here, that's something that I would try to really do is make sure that their depth perception and their eye coordination is as good as it can be. Um, if I can kind of interject too, if you don't mind. So something that like, I have a note here. Um, what I try to do is I try to create different, um, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, um, but I, I kind of learned that over time through your dad and stuff. But I try to change some of the distances that um, guys will train from just so that it can be some type of, of, of adjustability um, gap in within their training, not just, for example, getting on a machine that throws every pitch at 97 miles an hour. Um, hitters are really good at calibrating. And if all of a sudden you just keep putting them on the same speed over and over and over, um, they're going to, it's going to become easy. It's like, like anything you train it, you get better at it. So what I try to do is I, I put in different distances. So with a max VP or with a regular spin ball machine, whatever the case might be, is I ask my hitters to change their distance. Um, so it might start off at 55 feet and then it might have to move up to 45 and then back, back up to you know 54 or whatever the case might be. So I, I try to add some variability um, in the training, if that's what tool they have available to them to, to, to help them with some form of, um, you know, training, visual training. So that's one way that I, and obviously there's more, but there's not one that, not every hitter needs the same thing. I think that's the, the most important takeaway um, from, I think what Ryan is saying, or even what I'm saying is, is making sure that um, you provide them with what they need individually. Everyone's different. Um, they might have different capabilities or lack of capabilities and you need to make sure that you're accurately training those things. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, variability is, is huge. And, you know, some people use the word constraints, changing the constraints. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, what you're trying to challenge. And exactly. You can get so easy into one thing and, and there are guys and um, I could think of lots of stories that they can hit one speed, one speed, one speed, oh, one speed. Right. But it's getting that variability and getting how your brain is, is and eyes are working together to sure. do that. Sure. Um, now, Calix, we got a lot of questions that we probably didn't go Let's through. Let's do it. And um, if people have more questions, you know, I'd like to, uh, to definitely, um, you know, post them on there. There's an area that says question and answer or, or um, chat or anything like that. We'll try to answer as many as we can in the next five, 10 minutes on there. Um, but some of them that, let's see. Ooh, lots of questions here. Fine, fine, that's a good one. Let's see, I don't know where to start here. Warren, you got any questions? Uh, I had one. The one question that uh, I've got a lot of is, um, if you had to give one or two of your best drills on Max BP, um, or the most innovative or fun drills that you do? Um, the fun drills with a max BP besides uh, cranking it up and challenging someone. That's <laughs> it, always fun for us. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, we, I like to – the way I use it a lot because, again, I am not a hitting coach. I'm a vision coach. And so I look at how they're, how they're using their eyes with the machine and how their timing is and how they react to it. So we work on, and this is actually called the, the Barry Bonds drill. And the reason I call it the Barry Bonds drill is Barry used to do the same drill with a jugs pitching machine and a glove on his hand. And basically get into the hitting position and, and track it. And this, again, this is not a hitting drill because this will hurt your hand if you think of it as a hitting drill and your hand gets out and goes and hits it. But it's a tracking and working on, on using your eyes in a good position to track it as deep as you can. And what he would try to do is catch it as with a glove, uh, like I said, a jugs machine, uh, a real baseball, as deep as he could and know that he could see it as long as possible. And that gave him the confidence that when he got into the game, he knew if he can get his hands to it, he can get his bat to it. So that's one of my favorite drills with the Max BP is working on tracking it and catching it as deep as you can with your eyes. 
Um, my, similar. Um, so I have some um, Goldie gloves that I have my guys put on with the Max PT machine. Um, but what I what I often do is um, I'll have the hitter, you know. I'll choose a color form and I'm a hitting coach. So I like, I like when the guys are actually doing the act of hitting. Um, so I do use it for tracking a lot as well, but um, I'll ask the hitter to hit a specific color and then um, I'll change that color as much as I possibly can. Um, I'll ask them to take three of a color and hit one of, a, one of the other colors. Um, that's a really, really, and there's more, uh, but again, that's one of my favorite ones because it does add that, that element of, of making a decision which is what you're doing every single time that you have a whole plate. You, you know, we always like to tell our hitters that um, a good hitters are good takers. And so I think the reality is, is that um, a lot of hitters practice hitting the ball a lot. Not very many of them practice taking the ball, um, especially taking balls. Um, that is something that is so crucial to a player's development, just from gathering information, gathering um, the thousands and thousands of, of pitches that you need to gather so that you can um, send off your swing with a high level of accuracy. Um, so I think oftentimes in, 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 in training, guys should be, they should be making some type of a decision when they're, um, when they're hitting a ball. Yeah, I think Calix, uh, I'm glad you talked about taking there because that is a key component that I see, especially I see it in softball, but I do see it in baseball as well is lazy takes and takes are a great opportunity to build up a database in the brain. And the more we see, the more we know how to react to it, even if it's sure. not the same pitch I want to hit, but um, you know, it, it, you, you want to see as many pitches as possible. And that's where, you know, I, if, if you don't have the machine or you don't have some of these tools, my recommendation is go get in a bullpen. And I know it's tough these days, but once you get back, you want to get back to, to really seeing the pitch the best you can. You need to go practice getting in the bullpen with intent, not laziness. Just going, hey, what's going on, you know, and joking around with the catcher. But getting in there, working on how you can pick the ball up out of the release po point more efficiently, but also track it as long as you can. And if I add to that, I would say step out and visualize. Picture yeah. how you would make that reaction, how you would swing at it. Would I take that pitch? Would I not? Now, just to add on to this, um, to it is Mike Sweeney uh, was very good at this, and, and uh, he learned this from my dad, and he, 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 I know there's other players that, that do this, but during the game situation, when he was in the on-deck circle, what he would do is take every live pitch. Yep. You see guys Same in here. the uh, sw swinging, not even paying attention to the pitch. He would intently track the pitch. And then what he would do – in between is replay that same pitch and then put an action to it. He would either take it like if it was a ball or he would actually mm -hmm. put his swing that he would want on that, that pitch. So it's a great opportunity to practice, uh, you know, the eye and the brain connection uh, as much as possible. So we have, um, obviously, as a, as a major league hitting coach, um, I have access to boatloads of really good um, data. And, um, you know, I wish I could show you some of it. It's, it's, but the reality is, is that top, like the top 10 hitters in, in baseball, you're going to find a, a very um, similar correlation. Um, you know, Mike Trout, um, when he first got to the big leagues and this dude's Mike Trout, like for me, like playing in the same division or coaching in the same division as Mike Trout, you oftentimes, um, you're just in constant, in a constant state of awe um, because he's getting better, right? Like it's weird, but why is he getting better? Um, Mike Trout used to swing and miss a lot and swing a lot. Um, I think over the past four or five years, Mike Trout has narrowed his, his, his scope of, of pitches that he can't hit. Um, when he first got to the big leagues, he, he couldn't hit a lot of them. Well, you know why? Well, he started learning which ones he could hit well and which ones he should take. So those numbers begin, they began to change, right? So Mike Trout now is able to lay off of a pitcher's best pitch confidently knowing that he is seeing everything that he needs to see. And when it's time for him to send off his best swing, he's used those previous takes as a great timing opportunity, a very substantive taking opportunity so that when he does decide to send off his best swing, he's sending it off with a high rate of success and a lot of accuracy. So um, hopefully that makes some sense, but the best hitters, they, um, they often do that. Yeah, you know, Calix, uh, I think we're going to wrap this up a little bit. And, you know, for the people that sent some questions, you know, I appreciate those questions. I'll try to get some emails out to uh, 
to answer them specifically for you. But hopefully, uh, you know, give us any feedback. I hope you guys learned some stuff. Uh, it's always fun talking the game, and especially when we have a little bit more time and there's nothing on TV to watch anymore. But, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, we don't have all the answers. We just have some ideas and some things that some players have worked with uh, and some ways to train some things that, that uh, we have found some athletes to find to be very successful. And, you know, if I have my big advice, whatever you do, whatever you're practicing, you know, ask yourself, what are you looking at? What are you focused on? Where are your vision to be at, mm. at, at any given moment, whether you're fielding, whether you're pitching, whether you're hitting. And, you know, if, if, if I could sum this up from a hitting standpoint is a major leaguer is going to get roughly in a full, full season, healthy season, 600 plate appearances. Mm -hmm. and those 600 plate appearances, they're going to get an average of about four pitches per at bat. So you're looking at about 2,400 pitches that they're going to, to be able to have an attempt at. They're not going to swing at all those, but they're going to have an attempt about at. About 50%. Yeah, they swing at half of those. So that's 12, 1,200 swings that they're going to have. And I ask this to a lot of players. What percentage of those swings are perfect mechanics? And they all laugh at me. And they all say probably less than 5%. Perfect. You know, we try to be perfect. But I, don't, I look at it different. The challenges of those 2,400 pitches – how many of those pitches do you see really, really well? And find a way, whether it's our way, whether it's another way, whether whatever way it is, how can you see those 2,400 pitches better and give yourself a chance to, 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 to be successful? So that's, that's how I'd like to leave it. Neil, uh, I want to add, let you jump on real quick and um, add anything on the Max BP and then let Calix uh, wrap it up a little bit. Hey, thanks a ton. Really appreciate everybody being here. Um, if, if anybody has any questions, some of the drills that uh, Ryan and Calix talked about are on our website. If you go to maxpp.com and go under videos or drills, um, there's some great examples where uh, Ryan and others are demonstrating some of these and uh, happy to answer anyone's question. Again, thank you all for joining. Any feedback you have is appreciated. And Warren, did you have anything you wanted to add to us? Um, uh, Ryan, thanks very much, uh, Calix, as well. Um, super valuable. We've got a lot of questions. Uh, everybody can expect a summary of the key points, and uh, I took a lot of notes. Um, and then uh, just again, you know, feel free to contact Ryan or I on additional information. Um, and I'll, I'll put the screen up um, as soon as uh, we finished here. Yeah, and, you know, just from a marketing website, if you guys are interested, Calix has a website, crabology.com. Uh, we have slowthegamedown.com and, and neurodynamic or ndvperformance.com and then also maxbp.com on there. So, Calix, I appreciate it. Uh, anything you want to sum up on this? Uh, Ten seconds. You know, I, I, the biggest thing I want to tell if kids are out there listening, moms, dads, obviously there's some really elite coaches on here. If you want your players to get better at something, they got to practice it, right? And they got to practice it with the proper intention. Um, I think if we don't, um, if we just practice just to practice, I think oftentimes um, our training gets lost in, in translation. Um, we end up not really going anywhere. So I would say to all of the youth coaches out there that had questions like, um, how do I get better at timing? Well, practice it. <laughs> um, practice it correctly. Get, you know, get your kids having at bats and stop, like, honestly, stop trying to coach them while they're going on in the game. I think you're going to take them away from the task of, of being a successful hitter. So, I mean, that's my, my final little two cents. Um, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. I know it was a great opportunity for me to get to um, talk a little bit about baseball. I've been working on my golf game um, and my kids more than I should. Um, here, well, my kids are fine, but golf game way too much. So I'm glad that I got to talk a little bit about baseball. Yeah, thanks again, guys. And uh, hopefully we'll do some more of these. And uh, again, give us any uh, uh, feedback, positive, negative, or any questions directly, um, reach out to us. So appreciate you guys uh, sitting and listening to us for the last hour. Thank you. Awesome.